Welcome to today's class. Today we'll be discussing about oogenesis. In last class we discussed about the spermatogenesis. We saw that the gametogenesis were of two types, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. We discussed about the spermatogenesis in detail the last class. We saw that the spermatogenesis occurred in the male gonad which is the testis. This process begin during the pubertal age group of males which is around 12 to 14 years of age and spermatogenesis led to the formation of spermatozoa. And uh, when this spermatogenesis stopped, we saw that the particular age when the spermatogenesis stopped was not certain. Now the oogenesis, this occurs in the female uh, gonad, uh, the ovary and it led to the formation of female gamete which is the ova. This process unlike spermatogenesis, it begins within before the birth. And this process ends when a woman attains a menopausal age group which is around 45 to 50 years of age. So today we will be discussing about the oogenesis in detail. We will be discussing about oogenesis in detail. Now in our last class we saw that for the gametes to be formed there was primordial germ cells. I mean uh, the gametes are derived from the primordial germ cells. So gametes are derived from the primordial germ cells. In last class we discussed that these primordial germ cells how they were derived. If this is the embryo at the earliest around second week of development we saw that it had the embryo had two layers. What I am drawing now that is the epiblast and this is the hypoblast. So this embryo at this stage consist of two layers that is the epiblast and the hypoblast. So this is our embryo. We know that it is suspended by two cavities amniotic cavity and the yolk sac. Now around second week of development the epiblast they proliferated and they gave rise to a cell which is called as primordial germ cells. Now because on the 15th day the primitive streak arised to escape from the primitive streak, primordial germ cells change their location into much safer place which is the dorsal wall of the yolk sac. Then we saw around fourth week of development, the primordial germ cells, they started their journey to reach the gonad and they reached the gonad by fifth week of development. Now the MCQ question frequently asked is the primordial germ cells are derivatives from the answer will be epiblast. So we will see how the primordial germ cells will reach the gonad. So for that we will draw one more diagram. So we will see that how the primordial germ cells will reach the developing gonad. So this bulge here that is the gonad, this is the posterior abdominal wall, this is the anterior abdominal wall. Now we are drawing the gut of the gonad. So what we have drawn is the gut of the gonad. We know that the gut is suspended from the posterior abdominal wall by the dorsal mesentery. So this is the dorsal mesentery. Now we will see how the primordial germ cells will reach the gonad. As already discussed around fourth week of development the primordial germ cells will start their journey and they reach the gonad by fifth week. They travel through the dorsal mesentery. As they are ascending through the dorsal mesentery this primordial germ cells undergo repeated mitotic division. Now what will happen? The fate of the gonad that it has to develop into a testis or a ovary depends upon the chromosomal complement of the primordial germ cells. If the chromosomal complement is 44 XX, the gonad develop into ovary. If it is 44 XY, the gonads develop into the testis. Since we are discussing about the oogenesis, the chromosomal complement will be 44 XX. Now, they reach the developing gonad by around 5th week of development. So the gonads have entered the primordial germ cells. Now since they have entered the, prime, uh, the gonad, we will see 
what how the primordial germ cells behave inside the gonad so for that we will draw a diagram of a ovary imagining this to be the ovary now we will first see that the primordial germ cells we will see that the primordial germ cells they have reached the gonad by around fifth week of development so these are the primordial germ cells once they enter the gonad they are now called as oogonia they undergo several mitotic division so these are the oogonias which undergo repeated mitotic division now what happens is around the end of third month what happens is these oogonia they will be surrounded by a flattened epithelial cells flattened epithelial cells which are now called as follicular cells so we will see that at the end of third month of intrauterine life what happens is the oogonia which were divided in by mitotic division they are surrounded by flattened epithelial cells which are called as follicular cells so this oogonia along with the follicular cells this is known as primordial follicle so this is known as the primordial follicle now what happens is this primordial follicle now what we see is the oogonia repeatedly divides mitotically and by 7th month the population of this oogonia will be around uh, 2 to 5 millions and so much of oogonia is not required they are not essential in the reproductive life span of a woman actually around 400 to 500 follicles are utilized in the reproductive life span of the woman so all the rest of them will die and they become atretic now what happens is around 7th month of intrauterine life these primordial follicle they enlarge they enlarge and they are now ready for division so they enlarge and they are now called as primary oocyte it is enlarged and it is now called as primary oocyte so this is our primary oocyte so simultaneously we will draw it here we discussed that the primordial germ cells once they enter the ovary they undergo mitotic division to form the oogonia so the primordial germ cells we will see they have entered the ovary and they give rise to they divide mitotically and they give rise to the oogonia so they give rise to the oogonia if we draw the primordial germ cells this is how it looks like this is the primordial germ cells just like spermatogenesis here in primord uh, the primordial germ cells they have 23 set of maternal chromosome if this is maternal and this is paternal set so n and n will be 2n 23 23 will be 46 so the chromosome number will be 46 now let us see the genetic material present here the maternal set is one capital n paternal set is another capital n so the genetic material will be two capital n now what happens the oogonia we have seen here it gets ready for uh, div uh, it gets ready for division so it swells up so we have drawn from here to here to form the primary oocyte so it forms the primary oocyte so this is the primary oocyte now we will see how does this look like so this what happens is it doubles its genetic material the chromosomal number however they are constant so small n is equals to 2n chromosomal number is 46 now we can see 2n genetic material 2n genetic material so capital n will be 4n this is frequently asked mcq question so the chromosomal complement of a primary oocyte so this is the primary oocyte so this is the primary oocyte the genetic the chromosomal number however will be 46 that is two small n is 46 and the capital n is the genetic material present which here it is 4n because the genetic materials have doubled in order to divide now what happens is 
so this was around the seventh month so around seventh month what happened the primordial follicle they enlarged they are getting ready for division and they are now called as primary oocyte now what happens just before birth is this primary oocyte it will divide it will uh, enter the first meiotic division but it is arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division so what happens is the primary oocyte will divide and it is arrested in prophase of the first meiotic division so this will be the primary oocyte which is arrested in the prophase of the first meiotic division now what happens is immediately after birth immediately after birth if you see the ovary of the female baby what what you see is in the cortex there is so many follicles and all the follicles they from the prophase of first meiotic division they have entered a resting phase so they decide to rest and that stage is called as diplotene stage okay so that uh, diplotene phase so what happens immediately after birth of the baby all the follicles they from the prophase of the first meiotic division they decide to enter into a resting phase and that resting phase is known as diplotene phase now what is that something which sees that the oocyte doesn't complete its first meiotic division the follicular cells will secrete the oocyte maturation inhibitor which inhibits the completion of the first meiotic division now what happens is the diplotene phase occurs from birth to puberty so these follicles are in the prolonged resting phase which is from birth till puberty usually uh, puberty occurs in females around 11 to 13 years of age so what happens from birth to almost 11 to 13 years of age these follicles they rest in a resting phase which is the diplotene phase just few days before the ovulation what happens is some 15 to 20 follicles will be selected and they are allowed to grow so what nature does it just before uh, the onset of puberty some 15 to 20 follicles will be selected they are released from the diplotene phase and they are allowed to mature now let us see how the maturation occurs we already know that the follicles they are surrounded by flattened layer of epithelium now what happens is the flattened layer of epithelium becomes cuboidal in the next phase of development so what happens is if this is the primary oocyte instead of flattened epithelium it is now changed into cuboidal epithelium so this is the cuboidal epithelium and this is the primary oocyte in the next stage of development what happens is a glycoprotein layer is secreted so what happens the follicular cell and the oocyte secrete a glycoprotein layer which is called as zona pellucida it is called as the zona pellucida now what is the importance of zona pellucida is it has a role of protection and maturation uh, sorry nutrition and support to the embryo now the fertilization occurs within the uterine tube the function of the zona pellucida is to see that it safely brings the embryo from the uterine tube till the lumen of the uterus and then it disappears so that the embryo can implant into the endometrium of the uterus if this zona pellucida disappears even before reaching the uterine cavity then the embryo by nature is very sticky it will stick to any mucosal surface it comes so it results in formation of ectopic pregnancy so the function of zona pellucida is to see that the embryo is traveled safely from the uterine tube it reaches the uterine cavity once in the uterine cavity the zona pellucida disappears and thereby the embryo will implant into the endometrium of the uterus so that is the function of the zona pellucida now we saw that the primary oocyte which was surrounded by flattened epithelial cell has become cuboidal so 
This giboid follicular cells along with the oocyte, they secrete a glycoprotein material which is called as zona pellucida. So the green color what I have drawn is the zona pellucida. Now what happens is these cuboidal follicular cells, they multiply, they will proliferate. So we will see that the cuboidal epithelial cells, they will proliferate into many layers. So what we are drawing is the cuboidal epithelial cells. These are now called as granulosa cells. So these are now called as, we are drawing the granulosa cells. So as you can see, they are multiplying. The single layer of cuboidal cell is becoming several layers. So we are drawing several layers of granulosa cell. Now, we will draw the zona pellucida. So, this is the zona pellucida which is in between the follicular cells and the oocyte. So, this is the primary oocyte. Now, what will happen is fluid filled spaces appear within this follicle. Fluid filled spaces occur within the follicle and this is now called as antrum folliculi. It is now called as antrum folliculi and the fluid is called as liquor folliculi. Now what happens in the next stage is these spaces enlarge abundantly. So what happens is the spaces enlarge abundantly such that we will draw we will see how it looks like. So what I am drawing now, these are the granulosa cells. So we are drawing the granulosa cells. We will draw one more layer. Now the space enlarges in such a way that there is a single cavity. So now we will draw the ovum. This is the zona pellucida and this will be the ovum. Now the granulosa cells which surrounds the ovum that is called as cumulus ophorus. This is a MCQ question. So you can see the granulosa cells which surrounds the ovum, the primary oocyte that is called as cumulus ophorus. This is a MCQ question, cumulus ophorus. So this cavity has enlarged. Now what happens? These cells which attach the primary oocyte into the periphery, these cells are called as discus prolegerus. This is also MCQ question. Discus prolegerus. Now what happens at this stage is the connective tissue surrounding the ovum, the connective tissue surrounding this follicle that will differentiate and it is called as theca folliculi and it differentiates in such a way that it has an inner layer which is vascular and it is having steroid secreting cells and this is called as theca interna. This is theca interna having blood vessels and the steroid secreting cells which secrete the estrogen and the outer layer is theca externa which merges with the connective tissue of the ovary. So this is the theca externa. Now we will see one more change here itself. Now what happens is there is something called as perivitelline space which is in between the zona pellucida and the cell membrane of the oocyte. So what happens is between the zona pellucida and cell membrane of the oocyte a space exists. I will draw here in bigger thing. Between the zona pellucida and the cell membrane of the primary oocyte a space exists and that is called as the perivitelline space. It is in this space that first polar body will be accommodated. We will see now what happens is at this stage there is something called as LH surge. So what is LH surge is approximately 76 hours before uh, ovulation 
the luteinizing hormone surge occurs and this surge sees, brings about the completion of the first meiotic division. So what happens? So primary oocyte undergoes the first meiotic division. So it undergoes the first meiotic division to give rise to haploid. So haploid secondary oocyte. So it will have 22x and 22x. So this is called as secondary oocyte. And this is the first polar body. Now what happens at this stage is, so when the follicle is like this, what happens the first meiotic division is completed, which was arrested in the prophase of the first meiotic division is completed just 76 hours before the ovulation. Now, so once the first meiotic division occurs, what is formed? Secondary oocyte and the first polar body. Now, what is this first polar body? So what happens is most of the cytoplasm is retained by the secondary oocyte and the first polar, polar body receives only little cytoplasm. So this forms the first polar body. Now what happens is this is the first polar body which is accumulated within the perivite line space and this is our secondary oocyte. So this forms a secondary oocyte. Now the ovum prepares itself to burst out in the place to send the secondary oocyte. So what happens is it bulges at the place where it has to burst and release the secondary oocyte. A avascular pole occurs here which is called as the stigma and the luteinizing hormone it has a collagenase activity which breaks up the collagen fibers and thereby helps the ovum to burst and release the secondary oocyte. Now, what happens? The ovulation which occurs around 14th day of the menstrual cycle which is around 28 days. So what happens around the 14th day of the menstrual cycle? This ovulation will occur and thereby what you are seeing here that is the secondary oocyte. So this is the secondary oocyte within the perivital end space you are seeing the first polar body and this is the secondary oocyte and the cumulus ophorus will be arranged in the form of a circle and they are now called as corona radiata. So these are called as corona radiata. Now what happens is nearing the ovulation the fourth part of the uterine tube which is called as the fimbria it has finger like process if you imagine this as the ovary the fimbria it starts rubbing around the ovary it becomes very active during ovulation so once the secondary oocyte is released it picks it up and it transfers it to the ampulla of the uterine tube so once the secondary oocyte is picked up by the fimbria it is the movement of the cilia which the secondary oocyte will travel all the way and they reach the ampulla of the uterine tube where fertilization occurs at this time if the male gamete spermatozoa is deposited within the female genital tract the sperms ascend all the way and reach the ampulla of the uterine tube and they will fertilize the secondary oocyte and thereby a definitely ovum is formed what happens if there is no male gamete in such case the secondary oocyte it will rest in the ampulla of the uterine tube for around 24 hours if there is no male gamete it dies and undergoes atretic changes uh, immediately after 24 hours of ovulation so once the male gametes if in case they are present they are during fertilization just before fertilization the second meiotic division is completed now we will see secondary oocyte will undergo further second meiotic division and it will give rise to a definitive ovum and second polar body second polar body but the second meiotic division is uh, uh, it occurs only during fertilization now we will see what happens to the follicle after ovulation we know that these are all the granulosa cells so what i'm drawing here these are these granulosa cells so they are the granulosa cells 
Now we saw that the theca interna, they were estrogen secreting steroid cells and blood vessels. The blood vessels will come inside and vascularize the granulosa cells. Now the luteinizing hormone, it gives a yellowish pigment to these granulosa cells and these cells are now called as luteal cells. Now what happens is, uh, this corpus luteum, if there is no fertilization, it is called as corpus luteum of menstruation. It persists in the ovary for around 14 days and if no fertilization has occurred, it will undergo atretic changes and it is called as corpus albicans. If fertilization occurs, this corpus luteum is called as corpus luteum of pregnancy. It persists in the ovary for 4 months and it helps in secretion of progesterone. After 4th month, when the placenta is itself capable of secreting the progesterone, this undergoes atretic changes. So that is about the cycle, how ovulation will occur. Now there is one importance of this diplotein phase. We would have seen that increased maternal ages, there are more chances of a, chromosome, a baby born with chromosomal abnormality. That is because if a woman plans to conceive around 35 to 40 years of age and thereon, what happens is uh, if she plans to example at 40 years when she plans, some 15 follicles will be selected. So the follicles selected, they were in the diplotin phase right from birth up to 40 years. So such long gap from birth to 40 years, they were arrested in diplotin phase. So there are more chances that chromodomal, chromosomal disjunctions can occur and uh, it will result in mostly the Down syndrome. So this is how eye maternal age uh, brings about the chromosomal abnormalities. Now here you can see unlike spermatogenesis where one primary spermatocyte gave rise to four uh, spermatids but here in oogenesis you can see one primary oocyte will give rise to only one ovum and two polar bodies. Why does this occur? This occurs because in the primary spermatocytes the nucleus is centrally placed but in case of primary oocyte what happens is the nucleus is eccentric in position that is because of the deposition of fatty substance uh, lecithin like substance which is called as deutoplasm whose function is to provide nourishment now what happens because the nucleus is eccentric in position equal division is not occurring and thereby one primary oocyte will give rise to only one ovum so that was about the oogenesis. So hope you all understood today's class. Thank you so much for watching today's video.